Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another uh, SVA talk. Uh, you're really very welcome indeed. I'm sure by now you know what I'm going to say, and that is to ensure uh, that everybody's muted, please, for the um, for the talk. Uh, and if anybody has any questions at the end of Deborah's talk, then please could you use the chat button rather than unmuting yourselves. Now, uh, Deborah, um, if I can just give a few words of background about Deborah Robertson, and that is that uh, she's had a very interesting background. Uh, she, um, when she was younger, she um, farmed. She has worked in advertising and market research uh, and project and program management, including a change program for a large public body, uh, which she did prior to uh, retiring uh, with Ken, her husband, to Sidmouth. I should also say uh, that she's an expert skier, although I don't think she does very much uh, in Sidmouth, and she speaks Norwegian fluently, uh, but she's going to give this talk in English. Uh, now, some time ago, she became a steward in the museum. Uh, it was clear uh, that uh, we could uh, <laughs> get uh, additional help from her and she went behind the scenes as it were to look at our art collection. Uh, when Four Street headquarters opened, uh, the SVA um, headquarters opened, the, part of the top floor was given over to the museum's uh, art collection. And this is a, a good collection of watercolours and oils, but it has an outstanding Sidmouth print collection. And Deborah uh, helped sort it out completely, catalogue it, and uh, in doing so um, became uh, very, very knowledgeable about the prints. And she has researched these and it is, uh, uh, and she has prepared a publication from it, which I'll talk about uh, at the end of her talk, but she will mention it as well. And so um, it's a great pleasure, uh, Deborah, to uh, have you. And we look forward very much to hearing about Sidmouth, a celebration of the print. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Nigel. And thank you to the SVA for enabling me to give this talk. Well, it was advertised as, um, well, certainly describing me as being sometimes found in the attic above the SBA offices. And it does rather sound like I'm a little bit like Miss Hathaway, sort of covered in cobwebs and dust. And well, that has happened. And as Nigel said, for the last few years, I've been curating the art and prints. And while I was doing this, I discovered that there was an incredible number of separate prints. And later on, I found out that there are more topographical prints of Sidmouth than any other comparable seaside town in Devon. In fact, I've counted 247 of them in the museum's collection. I've often wondered why this was the case and who were they for? But, but most importantly, who created them? And then if we cast our minds back to just over a year ago, March 2020, the country went into its first lockdown and sadly the museum was unable to open. And so I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do now? Then it occurred to me, this would be a really good time to try and answer some of these questions. And then I thought, wouldn't it be even better if I could showcase the museum's entire print collection in a single book? And that's exactly what I did. And so the book includes them all. I've placed them in the historical context they find themselves in, and there's a description of each of the prints and information about who sketched, engraved, printed, and published them, as well as the techniques they used to create them. But my talk here today is really just to give you a flavor of the book and to introduce you to just a few of these characters and share with you one or two of my discoveries. 
But before I do this, I'd like to show you this graph. And this is topographical print production spanning the 80 years from the first sigma print to the very last. And if you look at the graph on the left-hand side, the first two decades, there are very few prints produced at all. And I've used Dawlish, Tinmouth and Exmouth as quite good comparisons. Also, I've managed to gather the data from these three places. Well, then in the 1810s, something extraordinary happens to Sidmouth and we have twice as many prints as anywhere else. And then the decade after that, there's a pure explosion of prints. And we have 106, it's extraordinary. And in the decade after that, we still take pole position for prints, but then it tends to tailor off. And in the 1870s, there are very few produced at all. And 1876 is the year of the very last Sidmouth print. So, first of all, what do we really mean by topographical? Well, if you look at the dictionary, it will tell you it's mapping the features of a given area. But in art historical terms, it's closely associated with descriptive genres of landscape and townscape views. And these are represented in paintings, drawings, and of course, prints, which is our area of interest. Well, for Sidmouth, the print age started just before the 1800s. And this was the time when the town was beginning to become a fashionable resort. And I have discovered records as early as the 1770s that mention sea bathing in the town. But it wasn't really until the 1890s that Sidmouth became more widely known. It's mild climate, picturesque scenery, and at the time relatively inexpensive accommodation started to entice the gentry from the old spa towns such as Cheltenham, Bath and Bristol. And at the time, the fashion was that sea seawater had as many health-giving properties as spa water. Well, the first artists that came to Sidmouth would probably have been influenced by some of the diarists and guidebooks that had been written by travellers really from the 1760s onwards. And they described Devon as a really wild, inhospitable, unexplored region. But I have read quite a few of these and some of them do suggest that there might be some good places for sketching. And at this time, it was the beginning of what we refer to as the picturesque movement. And this was a new aesthetic ideal that idealized landscape in a rather rose tinted kind of way, a pristine environment. So we don't see scenes of industry, it's devoid of human intervention, no poverty, agriculture, anything like that. And I think Sidmouth prints really tend to follow this stereotype because in them we see soft green hills, well-dressed tourists on the esplanade, and of course, many grand houses. And they were designed to promote the pleasures of the area and attract people to the town. And the growth of landscape painting, therefore, was really inextricably tied up with tourism and artists only began to visit towns such as Sidmouth after tourism had really become established. So I think it's time to meet some. Well, this is Sidmouth's first known print and it was sketched in 1796 by a Mr. Rowe. And that's really all we know about him. It was then made into a copper engraving by John Walker, and it appeared in a publication called The Itinerant, and this was a collection of views of Great Britain and Ireland. Well, John Walker was quite a well-known engraver. He'd been taught by his father, and he produced most of the 180 views that were in this publication, and some of those were from sketches by J.M.W. Turner and Thomas Girton, both of whom were right at the beginning of their careers. Now I came across an account which was written just a year before. And it, what really amazed me was that even in 1795, Sidmouth was able to offer its visitors shops, theatres, circulating libraries, and even a bank, which I believe 
produced its own Sidmouth one pound note and you could eat ice cream. And there was a new gravel walk that people could parade along. Well, our Mr Rowe would probably have stayed in one of the many lodging houses that were being built. And he certainly didn't have to travel very far to provide us with, for many of us, this very familiar scene from the top of Sorkham Hill. And if you look into the picture, on the other side of the valley, you can see a very large white house. And that was the home of Emmanuel Barrow Lasada. And he'd come to Sidmouth in 1788, originally to rent a place, but he fell in love with the town. And literally a day later, he bought some land and built this magnificent villa. And he became a very well-known figure in the town. In fact, many people think that it was due to him that other people came to live in Sidmouth. Well, our next scene is an etching and it's from a drawing by Joseph Farrington. And he was a landscape painter, renowned for his accurate topographical drawings, which he produced for the tourist market at the time. And he wrote several personal accounts of his West Country tours. And I've read one of these. And this one, which is when he sketched this particular scene, he said that he loved the area around Exeter and he loved it for its architecture, but he particularly liked the fact that he could go out socializing and drinking. So he was quite a lad. Well, this particular scene was engraved by a lady called Letitia Byrne. And she was the third daughter of a William Byrne and came from an engraving family. And she must have been a very talented young lady because she exhibited landscapes at the Royal Academy at the early age of 20. And I've discovered that she illustrated books and created many works such as this after Joseph Farrington. And it wasn't so unusual for women to be involved in the industry. And certainly from the 18th century onwards, women in the trade increased quite considerably. In fact, etching became really a quite a fashionable pursuit for the educated leisure classes. I mean, those who had obviously had the funds to pay for tuition. And Joseph Farrington himself, I think it's quite an enlightened artist because he worked with a very large group of female artists. So I like Joseph Farrington. <laughs> Well, Sidmouth, I suppose, is always referred to as a Regency town, as it was during that time, it became a fashionable resort. And as the town started to attract more visitors, many set up home here. And the more affluent built a large number of marine villas, which often took the form of the Strawberry Gothic Revival style or a thatched cottage known as a cottage or name. And they might have been called cottages, but they were certainly, many of them, large country houses. And they tended to be occupied by retired nobility and were particularly popular with returned East India Company officials. And some of these colonial administrators tried to replicate their old villas by incorporating wide verandas into the property, as we can see here in these two prints. So perhaps it's not surprising that these elegant buildings became the subject for artists and engravers. And it's really this when the production of Sidmouth prints took off. I mean, the rise of the print industry in the county owes much to its collaborations with some of the London-based printer publishers. But interestingly, I've discovered that the majority of the Sidmouth prints were actually produced locally. Well, one of those London printers was a chap called John Wallace. And he arrived in Sydney in 1803 to take advantage of what he believed was to be a potential market in the Southwest for topographical prints. He came from an established publishing family who had been operating from the Strand in London. And he was a freeman of the London Stations Company. And he had already started to run his own business before moving to Sidmouth. Well, shortly after he arrived, he set up shop in a building known as the Marine Library, 
which was a circulating library on the seafront. And it's now the site of the Mocha restaurant. It was next to another building called The Shed. And this was a popular social meeting place where the landed gentry of the town congregated to be seen and discuss the latest news and gossip. Well, Wallace's tuition certainly paid off because it wasn't long before his bench began to flourish. In fact, to the extent that his initial building had to be replaced by a larger one. And this was open to the public in 1810. Well, if you look at the print on the left, I think it's probably one of the very earliest John Wallace prints. And on the right hand side of it is a building with a veranda. And this was the Marine Library shortly after opening. The picture was engraved by John Nixon and he was a notable amateur artist. And this particular print featured in the first edition of a very early Sidmouth guidebook, which was by the Reverend Edmund Butcher and it was called The Beauties of Sidmouth Displayed. And this was also published by John Wallace in 1810. Well, I found out a little bit about John Nixon, the engraver, and he was involved in many of the leading art circles in London of the time. And he produced landscapes, illustrations, and caricatures. And you can still see his work today in several public collections, namely the v &A and the British Museum. Well, back to John Wallace, well, his success continued. In fact, Nessa, that really, it was so popular and it was, he was so successful that he had to move further along the road to a bigger premises in 1813. And this is now known as the Bedford Hotel. Strangely, his new building, there was referred to as the Shed and it was a successful print and bookshop and you could read newspapers, magazines, and it served refreshments, and you could play billiards there as well. well the aquatint on the right shows this second premises, and this print appeared in a, a later edition of Butcher's Guide. Well, keen to promote his fashionable business, which by this time was being advertised as patronized by the nobility and gentry, John Wallace commissioned Hubert Cornish to make a watercolour panorama of Sidmouth, featuring at its centre, the Marine Library. Well, Hubert Cornish was the brother of George Cornish and George was Lord of the Manor of Salk and Regis. So an important member of Sidmouth society. Hubert was born in Tynmouth, but settled in Exeter in 1798. And this was after he'd been returned from India, where he'd been working for a few years as private secretary to his brother-in-law, Sir John Shaw. Well, Hubert was actually a lawyer by trade, but was also an accomplished musician and obviously artist. Well, the Panorama Commission took the initial form of some watercolours, which were produced in about 1814. And then these were scaled up to make a nine foot painting fashioned on six boards which were joined together to complete the picture. And this was actually published about two weeks before the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Well, the images from the watercolours were engraved in aquatint by Daniel Havel. And he was a very well-known London engraver. And you see his name on an incredible number of very early Sydney prints. Then he engraved this on copper plates and they were amongst the longest that could possibly be printed on a contemporary printing press. And arguably, arguably, I think this was probably Sidney's most iconic picture. Well, around this time, one of the artists responsible for a great number of Wallace's prints was at the time local resident, Henry Hasler. And he's probably one of Sidmouth's best known artists. He arrived in Sidmouth in 1816 and shortly after became a tenant of Clifton Cottage, which was owned by Emmanuel Asada, who we met a bit earlier. And I've discovered that Henry was drawing master 
and worked um, in local schools as well. But his contribution to Sidmouth's art scene really was prolific. In fact, he produced more work than any other artist that we know of in the town in the 19th century. And his work included watercolours, drawings, and nearly a hundred prints in aquatint and then later lithography. Well, the first large set of Hazlitt prints was published in 1817. And it was called, it was, it came, it was in a book and it was called Sidmouth Scenery or Views of the Principal Cottages and Residences of the Nobility and Gentry. And you can see all of these in Sidmouth Museum when it opens. Well, views of country houses were quite a popular and lucrative subject matter. And we often find that the subjects incorporate the grounds and parkland surrounding them, really to emphasize their grandeur. And they usually tell us who owned the property at the time. And here are two of them. Well, on the left, we can see Salcombe Hill House. And that was the home of George Cornish, who I just mentioned. And at one time, it was a hotel, but more recently, it has been converted into apartments and it's now known as Belvedere Court on the bottom of Hillside Road. Well, on the right hand side is Belmont House, as it was at the time. And some of you will recognize the part of the wall, which you can still see from the seafront. And this is supposed to have dated back to the Napoleonic Wars when a local militia was still garrisoned on Fort Field. And it was lived in by several families in the 19th century, but in 1920, it became the Belmont Hotel, which it still is today. Well, for the Wallace establishment, further accolades were to come. And in October 1819, the Duke of Kent pays a visit to Sidmouth and John Wallace had the great honour of showing him around the new seawater baths at the York Hotel. And while he was doing this, he presented the Duke with a copy of the panorama print, which apparently the Duke had accepted and said that he would look forward to showing it to Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Kent. Well, it's well documented that the Duke of Kent spent some time in Sidmouth with his family until his untimely death in 1820. But during his stay, John Wallace was appointed as Royal Bookseller and Stationer, and Sidmouth Museum has the original letter written by Sir John Conroy confirming the appointment. Well, part of John's success came about through his close associations with local wealthy people who financed some of his major works, but he also had good working contacts with some of the London publishers, probably helped by his own family connections. And one of those was Rudolf Ackerman of the Strand in London. And he was one of the most, the foremost lithographic printers in the capital. And he printed the first known lithographs in Devon, which just so happened to be of Sidmouth. And they were drawn by an artist who we only know by his initials, EIJ. And I spent many months trying to find out more about him. And there's only one reference that I can find which suggests that he might have been a local artist. But he produced um, a whole set of these and there are about 12 of them. Well, Henry Hassler also experimented, as I said, with lith lithography. And he produced these two prints that we can see here. I particularly like the one on the left of Sidford Bridge. Well, the next we hear of John Wallace was from an account of the Great Storm in 1824. And the weather in Sidmouth had been particularly bad. And a high tide swept through the town and destroyed many houses on the seafront, sadly including the Wallace establishment. And I've just come across an account which says that the Wallace family were really lucky to escape with their lives. And Apparently, they managed to get through an upstairs window, down some knotted sheets, into a boat that had miraculously drifted up to the back of the building. Well, after the storm, 
the library was rebuilt, but the business was sold in 1829. And I know this from a sale notice in the Exeter Flying Post. We know that a William Barrett owned the property shortly afterwards, but it had become the Bedford Hotel by 1835. And there are very few records of the Wallace family after that time. Well, John Wallace's Royal Marine Library was not the only circulating library in town. In fact, in 1812, an opposition library was built by a John Marsh. And he did this based on his assumptions that existing provisions for visitors were somewhat meager. Well, Marsh would definitely have been aware of John Wallace's first marine library, but unhindered, he built a new and imp an impressive structure with a well-appointed view of the sea and coast. And he equipped this library with an extensive range of reading materials. When a year later, when John Wallace moved to a larger premises, John Marsh, Marsh was less than complimentary. And he described it as rather small and inferior to his own. Well, both these entrepreneurs published guidebooks, highly praising their own establishments whilst highly criticizing each other. Well, for, for Marsh, his success didn't last very long. And in Exeter 1819, and in 1819, the Exeter Flying Post records his bankruptcy. And soon after that, the library closed. But for a short while, John Marsh was operating a pastry shop and an opposition billiard room to John Wallace. And there are records that indicate that there really wasn't much love lost between them. Well, we don't really know what happened to Marsh in the next few years, but there is a possibility that he might have made a comeback because I found him listed in Piggott's Dictionary of Devon in 1830. And there he's listed as a bookseller and stationer. Well, unlike Wallace, Marsh only produced a few prints, such as these two here, which were by landscape painter, William Noble. And they were engraved by Frederick Christian Lewis on one of his first visits to, the, to Devon, which he loved so much that he decided to set up home here. And a few years later, he became a Devon artist of repute. And Lewis regularly exhibited oil paintings and watercolors of Devon at London exhibitions. Well, almost as soon as Henry Hassler left Sidmouth, which was in 1826, there was another artist who came to town to draw views of the houses and scenery. And his name was George Rowe. He was born in Dartmouth, but raised in Exeter. And his artistic talent developed quite early. Although we don't really hear very much about him until he was around 27 years old. And at that time, he was living in Hastings and he was making a living as a drawing master. And his early topographical prints were really around Hastings, Sussex and Kent. And then George decided to move back to Exeter. Well, by the mid 1820s, mainly due to the efforts of John Wallace and some of the London publishers, Sidmouth was attracting more printmakers than any other Devon resort. And when George Rowe contributed to the scene, he was known to have sought the advice of John Wallace on the relatively new lithographic printing process. And he published his first series of Devon prints. And these were 48 views of the cottages ornate in Sidmouth in 1826 using this technique. And this was the largest set, single set of prints ever to be produced of the town. And here are some of them. Well, on the left is Arcot House and it was once the, the residence of an East India Company official. And it was named after Arcot, which is a small town in India, somewhere near Chennai. On the right-hand side is May Cottage. And at one time, it was Sidmouth's first hospital. And you may recognize it, it's now opposite, it's opposite the present hospital. But during the time of this print, it was owned by John and Anne Potbury, 
who ran a coal and timber merchants. And then John's son extended the business to include furniture on upholstery. And the company is still operating today as Pop Brees and Sons. Well, apart from the cottages, George Rowe produced many other prints of the town. And I've actually counted 65 of them. And here are some more. And this is the legacy that he gave our town. But his story doesn't really end there. He left Exeter in 1832 after producing some 177 Devonshire views and then went to live in Cheltenham, set up in partnership as Rowan Norman. And while he lived in Cheltenham, he became involved with many aspects of public life. He was an active member of his local church, held key positions in various financial institutions and was a founding member of the Cheltenham Liberal Association. Well, sadly, George made some very bad business decisions. He bought a theater that was very unsuccessful. And at the age of 56 and in not too great health, after suffering some really severe financial setbacks, he decided that the only way to recoup his losses was to go to the gold mines in Bendigo, Australia. Well, he got to Australia and he was really unsuccessful as a gold digger, hopeless in fact. So he decided to set up a canteen for the diggers. And just as it was about to open, the diggings dried up and a new site was found further north. But undeterred, George decided to go back to his original trade and so he resumed work as a painter. And this was a good thing to do because it would earn him a place amongst Australia's greatest goldfield artists. Well, he was able to return to England in 1859 and he submitted eight large Australian paintings to the International Exhibition in 1862. And this earned him the only prize ever given to an artist. Well, George spent the rest of his life in Exeter, and in 1864, he died after a long illness. He actually produced over 650 lithographs, mostly of Devon, and you can still see his grave in Hevertree Churchyard today. Well, as we move on to the 1830s and 40s, there are fewer houses that feature in the Prince of Sidmouth. Instead, the focus tends to be on the Esplanade, or views from Salcombe and Peak Hills. And the next two views of Sidmouth really exemplify this. And they were by David Roberts, who was a Scottish painter, especially known for his lithographic prints of the Holy Land, Egypt and the Near East. Well, David didn't actually start his life as an artist. In fact, he began his career as an apprentice house painter and decorator. He only studied, really studied art in the evenings. And his first job after finishing his apprenticeship in 1816 was as foreman for the redecoration of Schoon Palace in Perth. He then ran away with the traveling circus. And then we find him as a scene painter at the Pantheon Theatre Edinburgh and then the Theatre Royal Glasgow. Well, at this time, he began to develop a talent as a landscape artist, especially in oils, with some moderate financial success. And in 1822, he moved to London and he got a job at the Coburg Theatre, which is now the Old Vic, as a set designer. And then he started to exhibit paintings to the newly formed Society of British Artists. Well, his reputation as a fine artist continued and came to the attention of one J.M.W. Turner. He persuaded him to abandon all this scene painting and become a full-time artist. Well, they were wise words because Roberts then spent many years traveling in Spain and the Middle East before returning to Edinburgh in 1840. And he's considered to be one of the greatest Orientalist painters of the time. Well, the prints you can see of Sidmouth were actually created whilst on holiday in 1845. And 
David Roberts came to the town in June that year to join his daughter and son-in-law who were spending a six weeks holiday. Well, before leaving, he wrote to his son-in-law about his forthcoming stay. And it's quite interesting because there's a reference in the letter which discuss the forthcoming Sidmouth views. And in it, he says, my respects to the worthy publisher, and this would have been John Harvey, who'd replaced John Wallace as the town's main publisher. And if the subject is a good one, tell him if he's a good fellow, I will do it for love, but not all those wretched houses. Well, Robert sketched the first scene on the left from the veranda of Beacon Cottage, and that's where it's believed they were staying. And then to create a broader view and include probably all those houses that Harvey seems to have wanted, he then climbs up Sorkham Hill and sketches the final scene, which takes in the whole vista of the town, an esplanade. And then these two prints were lithographed by Robert Carrick, who was a Scottish painter and draftsman, who then hand tinted them. Well, around the same time as Roberts's visit, a local Devon artist and engraver, William Sprate, dominated the topographical print scene, pretty much as George Rowe had done earlier. But sadly, there are very few examples of Sidmouth. And the two that we can see here, of each side of the Esplanade, I think are some of the greatest Sidmouth prints that we have. And I love the fact that they're so vibrantly coloured and it gives you a real window of life as to what the town might have been like in the 1840s. Well, during the next three decades of the 1850s, 60s and 70s, things changed for the resort of Sidmouth, but sadly not in a great way. Sidmouth didn't really benefit as much from the influx of middle-class families that were starting to holiday in other South Devon resorts further west. And this was mainly because family holidays began to be beach focused. So, Children would have probably wanted to build sand castles, paddle in the sea, or play beach games. So resorts with the sandy beaches, such as Tynmouth and Exmouth, became really popular. Whereas Sidmouth, Seaton and Budley started to lose trade a bit because of their shingle beaches. And there was another reason. Sidmouth had to wait until 1874 to be connected to the railway network. And even then, only a few special excursion trains ran to Sidmouth from Exeter and of course the station itself was rather inconveniently situated about a mile out of town. Well gradually topographical print businesses started to adapt to this changing pattern of the tourist market. So they started to produce small-scale steel line engraved vignette views and as, the, as you can see here they were oval shaped pictures and they were manufactured in large numbers and they really catered for the cheaper end of the holiday market. And there were several major companies that produced them, but unfortunately, none of them ever reveal who the artists or the engravers were. But for local production of these, we're really indebted to Henry Besley. And he was one of the most innovative printers in Exeter during the 19th century. And really only the only significant Devon publisher in this field. Well, the Besley business was started by Henry's father, Thomas, in the 1790s. But when Henry took over, it just happened to coincide with an expanding tourist market and the development of the railway in the county. So recognizing a potentially growing demand, Henry started to produce route books of Devon and they listed day trips to interesting locations usually within each easy reach of Exeter or Plymouth. And these guidebooks became extremely popular, but Henry thought they would sell even better with illustrations and started to produce steel line vignettes to accompany the text. And he employed local artist, George Townsend, who made detailed pencil sketches that were then copied by engravers. All of these are sadly were uncredited well, the, follow the Sidmouth prints that we can see here were drawn by Townsend and they appear in a 
in a small booklet, which was called Views in Devonshire. And Besley published an, another sm even smaller series of vignettes. And strangely, they were distinguished by having serial numbers, which started at 100. I have no idea why they started at 100. And the Besley Company then experimented with tinted versions of the plates, like the one you can see on the left. And these were often used in the Root Book series. Well, as well as producing handbooks, the company expanded to include book sales directories and maps. And at the time, there were very few county maps published in Devonshire, but those of Henry Besley were amongst the few that were published in Exeter. And amazingly, over 260 years later, the family firm is still in business in Exeter, and it's known as Besley and Cop. Well, towards the end of the 1860s and 70s, the age of the print in Sidmouth sadly came to a close. And the last ever produced of the town were by William Frederick Rock of Rock and Co. And he was a Barnstable man, but he sought his fortune in London in the 1840s. And between 1848 and 1876, Rock and Co published over 7,000 nationwide engravings. They were probably the most successful, successful national publisher in this field. And almost all of the prints contain a serial number. Well, some of these were produced and published by Rock and Co. And others such as these were in fact published locally by John Harvey and Letherby in 1876, the very last year of the Sidmouth print. Well, I still think it's incredible to me that in the 80 years spanning the first to the last known printed example, Sidmouth could have been the subject of so many prints. And for that, we really have to thank local printer publishers such as John Wallace and John Harvey, and artists like Henry Hasler and George Rowe. But what has boosted the sheer numbers of prints has to be the subject, popular subject matter of the beautiful Sidmouth houses with their very distinct architectural styles, of course, which could only come about after wealthy people have built them. But one of the real reasons for writing this book is that so many of the artists and engravers that produced our vast collection of prints really deserve to be better known. So I hope that by introducing you to just a very few of them, you'll really want to know more. And the book has something about all of them. And that's really where I'd like to finish. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Deborah. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. And <clears throat> I think anybody who, I think those of us who love Sidmouth, as I guess everybody does who is watching and listening, um, uh, will realize that the prints really reflect the history of Sidmouth. And both the houses and the landscape are shown so well in the prints. And so by understanding the prints, we understand the town. Uh, so thank you so much uh, uh, for that. Um, I wondered if there are any questions. We do have one question from um, Colin Boynton, um, who asks Deborah, how did the prints get into the museum? How, why have we got so many? Where did they come from? Who gave them to us? Well, that's an interesting question because when I started to curate the prints, I found that many of them really don't have any provenance and they were simply discovered in the museum probably many years before my time. So it's difficult to know how, I mean, you do get the odd one or two that were bequeathed by people, but um, you know, the vast majority of them don't really seem to, we don't have any information about who gave them to us. No, <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, we have a few comments coming in, thanking you for, for a, a wonderful talk, but I wondered if there are any other questions. 
Um, perhaps I could say just a little bit about the book, if, if that's all right, Deborah. Yes, the, yes, please do. The book um, is, is poised uh, to go for printing and um, will probably uh, be returned in, uh, in about three weeks' time, three or four weeks' time. All the details about the book are on the SVA website. The book is um, going to be a limited edition of 100 copies. Uh, I think it's a really, really important book and would strongly urge people uh, um, to buy a copy whilst it is available, because after 100 copies, that will be it, you see. Um, it contains all the prints uh, in beautiful um, uh, colour form, exactly as we've seen in the PowerPoint. Uh, so please um, keep your eyes on the um, on the website um, when you'll see when it's available so that you'll be able to reserve your own copy. Um, and I think all I would like to do before finishing is to thank you once again, Deborah, for um, all the hard work that you've put into this. Mm -hmm. And um, we look forward very much to seeing the book.